Hey, this is Rick from 4 Community, creating community spaces so you can connect with others and also with God. Merry Christmas, almost, as we're heading into December and the Christmas season. I'm happy to announce that my tree is up and I've got all of the presents hidden in plain sight for my kids wrapped and already under the tree so they can't magically and mistakenly find them and suddenly know what they're getting for Christmas. It's wonderful. I was this week thinking about uh, something that happened back in high school all around the idea of integration. How we take newfound skills and we bring them into the rest of our other skill sets and the rest of our life and we blend them together so that they are a natural fit. That kind of integration. While I was in high school, I took a typing class and it was probably the best class maybe that I took in high school, the most useful, because I still use that today. However, when I was taking typing class in high school, I really had no idea what power was at my fingertips. By the end of the semester, I think I was clocked at about 35 words a minute, which isn't so bad way back in whatever I took it. However, let's talk about integration. I was typing in typing class, but I didn't use the skill anywhere else. I was also in something called computer science, where I was typing all the time. But in that class, I was using my two fingers, beep, 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 all the time. And suddenly, almost a whole semester or two semesters later, it clicked. I just learned how to type. Why can't I do that typing thing in my computer class too? Weird, eh? I just didn't get it at first. And so the process of integration started as I began integrating this new skill of typing into everything else that I did. So by the end of high school, I think I was clocked finally at about 72 words a minute, which is outstanding, I think, in my books. Clearly not in Guinness Book of World Record status, but but I still think I got a little something something when it comes to typing. Integration is its own work. Getting all of our parts working together so that we're well integrated, that's that's its own work all by itself. We can learn all the skills we want, but they're pretty useless to us unless we also learn how to integrate them and make them all work together. What about you? Can you think of some kind of skill that you've learned? And can you think of a time that you struggled, like I did, integrating that skill? What skill did you learn and and why was it difficult for you to integrate that skill into the rest of everything you are? This video is based on Colossians chapter 3 verses 5 to 10. In this passage we learn something powerful about this whole work of integration. After we have chosen to follow Jesus, after we have acquired that status of child of God, and Jesus' follower. The work isn't over. Jesus' work is done. Our work, however, has just started. Integration is its own hard work. Colossians chapter 3, verses 5 through 10. So put to death the sinful, earthly things lurking within you. Have nothing to do with sexual immorality, impurity, lust, and evil desires. Don't be greedy, for a greedy person is an idolater, worshiping the things of this world. Because of these sins, the anger of God is coming. You used to do these things when your life was still part of this world, but now is the time to get rid of anger, rage, malicious behavior, slander, and dirty language. Don't lie to each other, for you have stripped off your old sinful nature and all its wicked deeds. Put on your new nature and be renewed as you learn to know your creator and become like him. Ugh, morning already. My daughter is not up yet. Hey, come on down. It's time for for community. Coming. Let me do it this time. Okay, okay, okay. Hey kids, don't forget to look in the background for all the cool characters. And don't forget to watch this week's episode of Connect HQ. Bye! Here's the point that I'm going to try to make in this video about this text. 
Grace stops where autonomy begins. That's why integration is so very, very important. We can talk about God's grace all day long, and it is so wonderful, but God's grace never takes away our autonomy. Therefore, integration is so vitally important. I've occasionally gotten into conversations around God's grace and rules and laws and freedom. Sometimes we wonder if somebody's under grace and totally forgiven. Why does lifestyle even matter anymore? The argument goes, if I'm forgiven anyways, and if God loves me anyways, why can't I live any way I want to? And forget about the Old Testament, forget about the laws, forget about the rules. You know, don't tell me what to do because God doesn't tell me what to do. He just loves me and forgives me. All right, so let's look at this just a little bit. Let's look at God's grace and your autonomy and see what's happening in this passage all around this idea of integration. I've only got two points to share with you around this idea, and the first one is this. God is also angry. Also, what do you mean also? Well, God is love. He's absolutely love. He also, he loves you, and also God is angry. The text says, so put to death the sinful earthly things lurking within you. And it goes on to say, because of these sins, the anger of God is coming. In my high school, if I could flex just a little bit, because I can't really anymore, uh, in my high school, I scored the highest um, mark for computer sciences, I think two years in a row. And I received the award, but man, did I ever struggle, because when I first started in this class, I wasn't doing the typing thing, I was just doing the pointer thing. Now let me back up just a second. I scored really high in computer sciences and coding way back when, but it's completely meaningless today. I mean, back when, when I was doing my thing, there was no HTML, there was no Java, there was no object-oriented, nothing. It was Watcom and Turbo Pascal for me. Really, really out of date these days. And so all my awards are completely meaningless. I get to flex in this video, and that's the only place I get to flex. The struggle I had with coding at the time is that I wasn't integrated. I was just coding with my two pointer fingers and I never brought my typing fingers into it. I was stuck with my two fingers. That's before I learned how to integrate. Actually, that's before I worked on integrating my new skill into my other lifestyle. Once I started integrating, I actually became a better coder, certainly a much quicker coder. That's a very simple illustration, probably not powerful enough. I mean, the idea is that my, my wrong habit of, of typing with just one finger on each hand, it wasn't angering anybody except for me. It was just slowing me down. The lifestyle, though, that we were living before we started following Jesus, that's a real problem for us. If it wasn't a real pro if sin wasn't a big deal, Jesus would never have died on the cross, but sin is a big deal. And the lifestyle that we were living before we came to Jesus is a real problem for us. I mean, it's not as simple as typing with one finger. Our lifestyle made God angry. Hurting other people really does make God angry. Racism really does make God angry. Immorality I mean, the kind that truly objectifies and destroys another human being really does make God angry. Nonsensical violence. Anger territory. Okay, it's, it's nice to quote the passages and, and say God is love. And it's totally true. God is love. God's also angry. And that's also true. Because God loves us, he's holding back from unleashing his anger. However, as we see in the text, his anger is coming because of reasons like we read in this passage. Let's pause for a second and, and remind ourselves, does God love us? Yes, absolutely. He loves us, there's no question at all. Is God angry at some of the things that we do? Yes, God is absolutely angered by some of the things that we do. Where there's violence in the world, where people hurt other people, that's not the will of God. That makes God very unhappy. So let's go to my second point here. You have autonomy. The text says, put on your new nature and be renewed as you learn to know your creator and become like him. 
There's a question that comes up in my social circles from time to time. The question is, why does God let bad things happen to good people? Love the question. It is an awesome question. It's a fun conversation to have with some people. The premise of that question acknowledges a God that is in charge and loving, watching over us to ensure a good experience all through life. And that premise is just not true. It was true at one point. In Genesis, we read that God was actually physically present with us, ensuring that we were successful and fully taken care of. Genesis shows us that we rejected him. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John show us that we killed him on a cross, and we kicked him off our planet. Why would we assume that after having rejected and then killed God, that he would be there in the capacity of your personal caretaker? Is God in control? He's sovereign. He's Lord. Absolutely. And if he wanted to be in control, he would be. But he's not. That's because he's given control to you, to me, to us. You're in control. I'm in control. We're in control. You and I and all of us together. We're in control of caring for each other. We're in control of caring for this planet. So where's God in all this? Well, here we go. Merry Christmas. God came in a manger and surrendered himself to us. He has come to us choosing to become infinitely vulnerable, not to control us, not to take away your or my autonomy, but to give us a second chance to exercise our autonomy and to choose him and to choose each other. Once we've benefited from God's grace and forgiveness, we still have our autonomy. The work after we've chosen to follow Jesus is the work of integration. How do we integrate our new ability, the ability to connect with God as a friend and as his children? How do we integrate that into a life that used to only be used as a tool to reject God? That's the work of repentance and faithfulness. God really, really does love you. That's why Jesus came. That's why we celebrate Christmas. That's why there's a baby in the manger. It's all awesome. God really, really does love us. And you know what? Now it's our turn. Now it's your turn. Will we, in turn, change our lifestyle like God changed his lifestyle to come down to us, born in a manger, and eventually to die on a cross and rise again? Will we also choose to reciprocate and make right choices? Will we choose to exercise our autonomy, which God has never taken from us, and do right things that grow our relationship with him and also with others? Will we integrate the renewal that we have received? Here's the summary. Grace stops where autonomy begins. This Christmas, as we remember the story of Jesus' birth, as we remember the angels singing, and as we remember Mary and her journey and Joseph's step of faith as well, will we please choose to integrate our friendship with God into the rest of our lifestyle? That's it from me to you for now. Would you please like? Would you please share? Would you please subscribe? And also, would you please ask for the link. We meet on Sundays at the moment two times, once in the morning at 1030, once in the night at six o'clock for community, creating community spaces so you can connect with others and also with God. See you next time.